Well, I am so excited about our guest. Lisa Savage is an LCSW and is the founder and chief executive officer of the Center for Child Development and the Delaware Center for Counseling and Wellness, which provide community-based services for children and their families, as well as an active member of the Clinicians of Color. Lisa, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I was thinking as you were doing your intro, I was thinking Joe and I are Facebook friends, but I never see him on Facebook. And I don't know why, because you're so busy <laughs> doing everything else. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, I uh, I pretty much go on Facebook to serve next level practice. And then at the end of the day, I want to hang out with my daughters. So, of yes. course, of course, understandable. Yeah, I got a couple things going on. So Lisa, I'm so excited to hear about your practice and just take us through your journey of when did you start your private practice? We'd love yeah. to ask some questions about those early stages and then hear how yeah. it's grown over the years. Yeah, so um, I love talking about my practice because I feel like it's kind of unique in um, how we serve the clients that we do. So I started my practice years ago. I didn't formally start it full time until 2007. So in 2007, I opened the doors and, and launched into it full time by myself. And it started out, Joe, I was asked by a school district in Delaware where my practice is to provide mental health services in middle schools. Um, I loved it. I started providing mental health services in four middle schools. And then in the next year, they expanded it to elementary schools. And then that's when I hired my very first associate was in 2008. And in that time, since um, I hired my very first person who's still with me, um, I've grown to having over 50 clinicians now and hiring. 50, wait, pause. <laughs> 50 <laughs> what? Five, zero. Correct. Correct. Whoa. Yeah. It's a large practice. Um, never, ever envisioned having a practice this size. Um, but I think as a business owner, one of the things that I realized is that I had to, um, I had to grow to meet the, the, the demands. There were not a lot of child therapists in Delaware at the point where I started my practice. And so one of the things that I, I like to talk to people about is really creating your niche and your expertise. And so I decided that my practice was going to be entirely school-based mental health. And that's how I grew my practice was really zeroing in on being school-based mental health experts and taking our services to children um, and families in, in the school community. And that was probably the best business decision, one of the best business decisions that I've made because it really helped me to scale my practice to a point that I never even imagined. So did you have a building in addition to the school or was it completely going into the schools? So I had literally a 433 square foot office at the time that I started out in practice. Uh, so it was a little tiny office and because it was really more like a base. I mean, we, we do see, uh, and at the time I was still seeing clients in the office as well, but I knew that a lot of what I was going to be doing was going to be in the community, in the schools. Now, we, we now have 5,000 square foot office that we haven't used in 19 months. Um, <laughs> we had just moved into that space. Like we were only in there for like a few months and then, just you know. Just burning everything. money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, because I'm still writing that check each month. Um, but, you know, so we, we see people in the office now virtually, of course, but um, – in the state of Delaware, we're known for school-based mental health. So if someone says, you know, I want to get my kid connected to mental health services, they know that they're going to be calling this Center for Child Development because that's what we do. That's what we're known for. Um, as therapists, I think sometimes we become afraid of niching down, but it helped me to grow. But we also see quite a few adults as well in our practice. So once you become known for doing something and doing it well, then, of course, people, you know, are ringing your doorbell and wanting to access services for themselves. So we we have a very diversified population of people that we serve. I, I often say that people don't assume that a generalist can be a specialist, but they do assume a specialist can be a generalist. That you know, if you're really good Correct. at one thing, they're going to they're going to broaden that. Uh, I'm Correct. interested in just some of the basic kind of logistics and systems. So how does it work when a school wants to refer a child? I know. Uh, so 
Um, do they then contact the parent? Does the parent contact them? Uh, how does yeah. insurance work? Is the school paying? Is the parents insurance mm-hmm. paying? How is all yeah. the just like billing and, and all yeah. of that? How's that flow Great work? questions. Great questions. So we have established like a, what feels like at this point, a really seamless process to getting kids connected. In the beginning, you know, there were some glitches, but until we figured out this is how our system is going to work and implemented that system um, to a point now where it just works really well. And even if we bring our new school partners, we're able to say to them, this is how things work. So um, schools can refer their students, but the parent has to complete the consent. 99.9% of the time, the parent completes the consent for services. It's very, very rare that a parent says, no, I'm not going to access mental health services. So we have a point person in the school. Typically, it's a school counselor, but it can be a dean. It can be an admin. That person is the person who connects with the parents and says, hey, we have this additional support in the school. Here's the consent. Parents complete it. It comes back to our office. Um, Another thing that we did recently, too, was we put everything online. So we have... um, our consents are online. They go immediately to our office manager who then verifies the health insurance. Once she knows that that child has coverage, it goes to the therapist and that therapist is told you can get started. So we do bill insurance companies, obviously. Um, and do you have 60- an in-house biller or do you use an external organization to do that? We have an in-house biller. So we actually yeah. have three in-house billers who uh, manage all the financial part because it's a, it's a lot of moving pieces, obviously. Um, and so in the beginning, we were not collecting copays from families. So way back in 2007, 2008, and then I realized we were leaving a lot of money on the table and that we should be collecting copays for a lot of reasons. Um, so we, uh, mandate that parents have parents who have commercial insurance have a credit card authorization on file. And again, we don't receive any pushback from parents. They completely get it. But 60% of the population that we serve have medical assistance. Um, so in Delaware, there are two Medicaid um, managed health companies, and we're paneled with them. And 60, 60% of our kids or more have medical assistance, which, of course, makes it a little bit easier because you're not collecting a copay um, or having to seek any type of authorization. But for our commercial um, clients, we have a credit card on file. It is in their electronic health records um, and so it, it's become a very, very seamless process. Um, parents understand it. Schools understand it. We do have some school contracts where the school is paying for the mental health services. Um, with COVID, there have been more funding that have been that has been pushed into schools, so schools get it. Um, but the majority of our services are reimbursed through third party. Wow. And, and then, um, like, when you think about, managing 50 people <laughs> plus because yeah. yeah. then have admin yeah. um, to go from yeah. just, I, I'm starting a practice to this large of a business. I, I know that mm-hmm. for me, I've had to, with practice of the practice, we have eight staff in South Africa. We've got, you know, oh, five wow. sound engineers here in Michigan. We've got, you know, our consultants, our team is almost 20 people or so. Um, there's mm-hmm. skills I had to develop. There's also mindsets I had to develop um, to not just yeah. be that kind of frontline counselor or that middle mm-hmm. manager mindset. For you personally, what has shifted in you to be the owner, the CEO, when you delegate, how you think about things big picture, how you don't get sucked into the minutia of daily things? Like, Take us through some of that stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, another really good decision that I made was um, when I started out, I had typically the therapists that came to work for me were fresh out of grad school, eager to learn, really wanted to work with children. And so I've been very, very lucky in that most of them have stayed with me through the course of time. And so what I did that I think was a really good decision was I promoted six of them who are now in what we call the leadership team. I decided that I could not effectively run my practice doing it all. So I created positions for people who were with me, who have been with me um, for a very long time. So we have a clinical director. We have a director of staff and Um, community needs. We have a director of school-based mental health. We have an office manager. We have a director of, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on Bruce's title, operations director (laughs) um, that we just implemented. I think he's been with us for almost two years. And so 
I created like this collaborative model of management with my leadership team where we meet twice a week. We discuss issues, we discuss growth, we discuss goals. Um, and it's, it's very collaborative. I, people um, feel comfortable having their input. I value the input of my staff. Um, we put really clear policies in place for our employees. And so it's made my job a lot less stressful than it was when I first began. And I was trying to do it all by myself. Now, coincidentally, my sister, my biological sister has worked with me from day one. So um, she's part of that leadership team. So she, she knows me. I know her. I trust her. I can go out of the country um, for a couple of weeks at a time and know that everything's going to be okay because my team is, is on the same page as I am. They, they get the vision. I think, I think also an important lesson that I learned uh, that I think your, reader, your listeners will want to really hone in on is having a shared vision. And so when people are working toward a shared vision or a shared goal, typically that makes them um, like both feet in. That really makes them committed. And I think that my leadership team has that shared vision. And so now we're trying to trickle it down to our employees, everyone, including the admin staff, our, what is our vision? And we stay focused on that. We have it on our wall. We talk about it a lot. And I think that cultivates a culture that people want to be a part of. You know, I've heard um, many times that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I've found as I continue to grow my business, grow my influence, that it becomes harder and harder to find people that aren't maybe intimidated by my success or maybe mm -hmm. can even relate to it. And like, I still have my regular everyday friends too, that I've always had. And so I'm not saying like, yeah. I've outgrown you. I'm too good for right. you. No, it's not like that. Oh. <laughs> right. But, but how do you find peers that you can relate to as like a colleague? Cause you're probably not going to have that be staff members that work for you. How, how do right. you think about even socialization outside of your business in regards to finding mm -hmm. people that, that push you and help you think differently? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I've created a community like that. I'm a co-founder of Clinicians of Color, which is a large online Facebook group. And I found people in there who were in the same position that I am, owning large practices, trying to manage it, navigate it, um, and who have some of the shared struggles that I have and, and shared success. So really being intentional about um, finding people who, who get you. Um, and that certainly doesn't mean, like like you said, that you, you're not bothered with your other friends. Um, but it was really important for me to have people who um, understood what my day-to-day -day struggles were. Um, and for people that I could say, hey, I really don't know how to handle a situation like this because those kinds of things always pop up. My husband is also self-employed, has been self-employed for a long time too. He understands what it's like to own a business. Um, and so um, he always says, you know, he's a numbers guy. I am not a numbers person at all. So having somebody who is a numbers person who can help me look at my profit and loss state statement, my balance sheet, and make it make sense to me, that's been helpful to me um, mm. as well. That, and that was happenstance, of course. <laughs> um, so it just, you know, I just, I lucked out in that way. But really being intentional about creating community with people who, um, you know, had some shared um, uh, goals and some shared visions and struggles as well, who, who really understand what it's like to run a practice this big. Yeah. Tell us about the pandemic. I mean, if you're school based and your people were going mm -hmm. into schools and known for that, yeah. how'd, how'd yep. you get through the pandemic? What did you have to yeah. shift? What did you change? Uh, I yeah. couldn't imagine the stress of not only your own self in business, but 50 Correct. other people's livelihoods. How, how did you handle Correct. that? What worked? What didn't work? Yeah, that's such a great question because when I look back on it, um, I remember March of last year, school shutting down and us thinking, okay, Schools will be shut down for a couple of weeks. Once, you know, they open back up, we'll come back to the office and things will go back to quote unquote normal. And that didn't happen. So we quickly knew that we had to pivot. Um, fortunately, there was Zoom. Um, fortunately, um, we were able to pivot and get parents to, um, to buy in to virtual mental health services. It was a little bit of a slow process, 
process in the beginning because I think parents too were expecting that this pandemic would blow over and we would be back in school. So for the summer of last year, right after we shut down, we did virtual mental health. And then in the fall, some schools opened up and then they closed again, but we just kept pushing um, and we kept educating parents in schools about the importance of the consistency of the mental health services, Mm -hmm. particularly because we were operating under a pandemic and there was just so much uncertainty. I was stressed in the beginning. You know, I can't lie about that. I was stressed, um, very worried. We didn't lay anyone off, um, and I was very thankful for that. We did not have to lay anyone off. Um, And then, uh, you know, truth be told, there were relief funds that came around that we were eligible for, for, so we took advantage of that. That helped us, believe it or not, in the middle of a pandemic, to be able to give people raises. Um, And so that was nice. That I think that showed our staff, you know, they care about us, and that's really important for me uh, to convey that to my people um, because we we funneled money back into our staff and we're continuing to do that because as much stress as I was dealing with, they were dealing with that too because a lot of them have children that they had to teach. The other thing that we did that I think helped is that we lowered the um, expectation for our, our therapist. So typically in a week, we ask our, our therapist to see 25 clients because our therapists are on salary. So that's how we afford to be able to pay their salaries. Last year, we lowered it because I did not want my employees or me to have that additional stress of, we got to get our numbers up, we got to get our numbers up. So we lowered that. Um, now that school's back open, and it has been now for over a month, um, you know, we're starting to feel like there's some sense of normalcy coming back to the way that we've done things. We're still doing some virtual mental health, but we're getting tons and tons of referrals from schools. Um, and our therapists are, are pretty much back in the school and feeling safe and, and doing what they've always done. Wow, that's amazing. Now tell me yeah. about, you've added some some assessments and things as an extra kind of form of revenue. Um, to yeah. Walk us through that process. I'm sure you kind of investigated it and got some of the information and data yeah. and tell us the results of kind of what's happened with that. So I've been saying for years, um, we provide great services. And I've been saying that and been saying that. And then I got to thinking like, how do we really prove that what we're doing is really great and it's effective and we're helping people. So we, we had started out my leadership team and I trying to figure out how we could use assessments to prove that we were being effective and not only prove that we are being effective, but also to help our clients to see how they were getting better or where they were still struggling with. So I asked my clinical director to um, do some research on software. So we, that did uh, measurement-based care. So we, we started meeting with people, interviewing them, testing out their products. And then we came across Blueprint. Um, like almost like, it was almost like magical because when, when I first um, had the first conversation with them, I was like, I can't believe the software does everything that we've been looking for and we've been struggling with this for a long time. And so um, they, we went through the demo with them. We met with them, with Matt um, over there at Blueprint. And I was like, guys, I, I kind of think this is the one. And we had another one that we were going back and forth with, but that other company just did not have the capability that Blueprint has. And so then I got skeptical. I was like, I don't think we're going to get reimbursed. I mean, you know, like we're not going to be able to get reimbursed for this. Uh, You know, these insurance companies aren't going to pay us. And Blueprint said, we're going to show you, we're going to do all of the upfront work so that you know exactly how much you're going to be paid if you're going to be paid. And I was like, okay, I was waiting for them to say, gee whiz, Lisa, sorry, no companies in Delaware are going to reimburse you for assessments. And that's not what they said. So um, so we signed on with them. We signed on and we did, I think it was like a 60-day um, on- onboarding. And we only used like, I think we maybe had 10 therapists sign up initially um, to test it out, to work out any kinks. And Joe, I was like, okay. This is not real. When I started seeing the revenue that was being generated from the assessments, 
I was shocked and scared. <laughs> do you, do you like, care to share? Do you care to share some of those numbers publicly? Uh, like, and oh, you don't absolutely. have to share whatever you don't want to. Okay. Absolutely, I would share. Now, I, I will say, a caveat is that average, re, average total number of claims that are paid is probably around 70%. But even at that number, on a good month, and this is before we went back to school where the bulk of our services are provided, we were bringing in an additional $15,000 revenue. On a bad month, it was per, like $7,000. Per month. Per month. Per month. Correct. Wow. Per month, yes. And what I love about Blueprint, too, is that they have a spreadsheet, a live, a shared Google spreadsheet. So I can go in at any point, and I literally did that today, to check to see where we were, how many assessments have been billed, how many have been paid, what's the expected um, total um, gross and net revenue. And um, and they, they update the spreadsheet weekly. So I can always sign in and get kind of my fingers on the pulse as to how we're doing. And then they take their fees out, which um, in, in my opinion, I would pay them any day of the week to do what they've done, helped, helped us to do in terms of generating additional revenue. So how does uh, it actually totally work? Brilliant. Like, so y- you sign up and then mm-hmm. um, like, like walk us through the steps of what Blueprint's doing, just because I, I feel like I have a general yeah. idea and I, I've talked to uh-huh. the people at Blueprint, uh, but mm-hmm. would love to just know, like, w- like, give us the three big picture kind of steps of what Blueprint's yeah. doing for you. So the biggest things that they've done for us is they, um, one, they found out who was going to reimburse us and how much they were going to reimburse. The other thing that Blueprint does, which is like, I think the selling point for me was they tell us based on the assessment that a, a clinician does with the client, this is the CPT code because they're various CPT codes. So they tell us this is a CPT code for this. So it takes the guesswork out. My clinicians or myself don't have to figure out, okay, what CPT code is this? They tell us for every single client, that's a major, <laughs> that's a lot. And they give us, they say, okay, you did this assessment on this date, you need to write your note. Um, they gave us a template for the notes, um, you know, how to, how to write the note for the assessment. And then they track every single claim that we send um, for the assessment. And then they put it in the spreadsheet and they calculate how much we're going to earn and how much we end up owing them. So before we get started, me and my operations director talked and met with them a lot to make sure that we understood what was going on in the back end. And then after all that happened, we got access to their website, which is there's also an app um, that our, most of our clients use. Clients were loaded into the website. Um, and it is all HIPAA compliant. We signed it. Yeah, I'm assuming business them. associate agreement, all that. Yep. You got it. Yep. We, we signed that. Um, and then we started slowly trickling it out to our clients. One thing that I really, really like about Blueprint is that they are open to suggestions. So there were, we work a lot with children and adolescents. So we needed some specific assign, uh, assessments. So Russell, um, Dr. Russell Dubois, who is their clinical director, sourced those assessments for us. Like we said, Russell, we need more assessments for, let's say, ADHD. Or we need assessments in Spanish because we see a lot of um, Spanish-speaking clients. So they source them for us. And they put them in their uh, software. And now we have access to them. The other thing that we um, that happened with us as well is that um, sometimes we'll have situations where um, a kid, uh, there's joint custody. So both parents need access to blueprints. So they were able to figure out a way so that there could be two separate accounts for one kid, or if there was a teenager who wanted their own account and didn't want their parents' email or phone number attached to that, they were able to help us figure that out as well. So them being open to suggestions and, um, based on the user experience has been like, like, Thank you. <laughs> this has been yeah. wonderful. Thanks, guys. 
<laughs> wow. That, that, I mean, I can't wait to continue to learn more. Um, they actually put together a promo code for us where um, anyone that wants to try it and get your first month for free, um, all you have to do is go over to bph.link forward slash Joe, and you'll get uh, a free month free. You can take the tour, um, check it out. Um, they are a new sponsor to the podcast, and we wanted to make sure that we could hear Lisa's story um, because to me, as we bring sponsors on, um, we do a ton of research. We want to make sure that we're looking for long-term sponsors that um, that we can really stand behind. And so to hear someone like Lisa um, share this, um, so just head on over if you want to check it out to bph.link forward slash Joe, and you can read all about Blueprint. So Lisa, the last question that I always ask people is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Um, so... A couple of things, Joe. One, that being in private practice is hard and that um, as, a, as a business owner who has a big practice, one of the things that I always say to myself is you still have to be coachable. You still have to be open to learning from other people. Um, and I think that's just really important. It's, it's okay to pay somebody to help you either to figure out some difficulties or figure out how to grow. So be coachable, be open to the learning process because every day I'm learning something new. Um, being a business owner is um, challenging. You have to wear two hats. One is a clinician, one is a business owner. And I think sometimes people don't understand that. They think if they hang up their shingle, that um, that's all that it takes. But there's definitely a lot of behind the scenes business stuff um, that you have to aim for. And then I'll also end up with saying that if you can get people in your practice who have that shared vision, you're going to buy loyalty to people. Um, they're going to, they're going to, uh, if they can adapt that vision and know that you're going to take good care of them. Cause I, most of my revenue, and I can say this publicly goes right back into my employees, whether or not it's due in salaries or it's through training. I invest in the people who work for me. I value them and I show them that it's not just with words and, and any of them would tell you that. Um, so it's important to invest in it. Now, I, my business model is a little different than other people. Um, I'm, I am 100% okay with reinvesting my, my uh, profits back into my people. I live a comfortable life. I'm not going to lie. Um, my husband and I travel to Europe. We go at least six weeks a year. So we are comfortable. But I also feel like I don't want people working for me who are struggling and who are poor and who can't figure out how to pay their own bills. So that's my advice to anybody who may be listening out there. Such good advice. Because I mean, I was wondering how these very first hires are still with you. And I mean, that's exactly it. You've taken care of them. Yeah. Uh, such yeah. wonderful advice. Lisa, yeah. if people want to connect with you, hear more about you, um, especially the, the clinicians of color, um, what, yeah. how can they get connected to all of the work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, so thank you for allowing me to share that. They can um, find us on Facebook at, under Clinicians of Color. We're on Instagram, Clinicians of Color. And then my email is lisa at cliniciansofcolor.org. Lisa at cliniciansofcolor.org. Um, I respond to every email that comes my way. So if anybody has any questions, um, I'm always open to responding to people. 